We're here this morning with Jane Erba Blatchford. She was born September 25th, 1923. Uh, she served in the U.S. Army Nurses Corps, achieving the rank of first lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Uh, okay. And she is from Kokomo, Indiana? Originally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where I was born. And my name is Sheila Propp. And this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project in the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. And we are here today at the Fairhope Public Library, Fairhope, Alabama. All right, would you uh, reiterate, Jane, where and where you were born? I was born in Kokomo, Indiana. Did you grow up there and go to school there? No, I grew up in a little town west of Lafayette, Indiana. Excuse me, east east of Lafayette, Indiana, and I was raised by my grandfather, who was a doctor in that town. My grandfather and my two brothers. All right. So the siblings that you had were two brothers, mm -hmm. younger or older? Older. Okay. What were you um, doing in the years the the years immediately preceding the war? Were you in high school? Or? Oh, I was in nurses. No. Uh, I was in high school before the war. In the town where and you And I graduated from high school in 1941. And um, we went into war that year. I graduated in, in May and we went into the war in December. Well, during your last year in high school, with the news of what Hitler was doing, what, was it on everybody's mind? Were, were the people worried where you lived? Or? Well, it was on the mind at our house because my grandfather was very civic-minded and these were discussions at the dinner table, uh, current events and so forth. Uh, it was just his nature to educate the three of us in that way. So I was well aware of what was going on, yeah. So you were a senior in high school, your brothers were they thinking about enlisting? No, my oldest brother was drafted that fall. Okay, into the Army? Army, mm-hmm. Okay, and what, what about your other brother? My other brother enlisted in, uh, I must have been 42, I don't really remember. And he went Air Corps. And I went Army Nurse Corps. <laughs> okay, now, when did you decide after high school to go into nursing? Oh, or long before high school. I never wanted to be anything but a nurse. That was my dream from at least 10 years old. Okay, so immediately after graduation, you proceeded uh, into nursing school? Yes, I did. And mm -hmm. where did you go? I went to St. Joseph's uh, Memorial Hospital in Kokomo, Indiana. And at that time, what was the length of time to become a nurse? It was uh, three years to get your RN to become an R registered nurse. Okay. It was a, a 1,036 days. You had to have actually that number of days. Okay. So you graduated from nursing school in what year? 1944 in May. And did you intend to enlist in the Army? Oh, yes. You did? Yes. yes. My last six months of training, I was in the Army in the Cadet Nurse Corps, which uh, the government established in order to furnish nurses because we were short of nurses in the Army, in all services. Mm -hmm. And I chose to go into the Army Nurse Corps and take my last six months of training in an Army hospital. And then, after I wrote State Board and became an RN, I could apply for a commission, which of course was almost automatic. So, where did you enlist exactly? Uh, well, in Indiana, but I don't, I don't know whether it was Indianapolis or, okay. I don't remember. <laughs> and once you went in, where did you serve for the first tour? Well, I took basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, Army nurses had to have basic training. And uh, then I was assigned to Ashford General Hospital in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. And uh, I served there. I don't know, remember, several months. And then I signed to go overseas as Army replacement for nurses who had been in uh, Europe three three years, a lot of them. You know, you didn't come home then. You went, you stayed till the war was over. 
at that point, did you have any friends or relatives that were serving as nurses overseas? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you enlisted to go overseas, and when did you leave the United States? I left in December of 45. Okay. So VE Day had, had taken place. Yes. So did that kind of change the tenure of... of Not really, because um, I knew that there were nurses over there that needed to come home, and I had nothing else to do, and I liked the Army, so. At that point, were both your brothers still living? Yes, both of them uh, in, in service, both of them still in service Okay. when I left, yeah. Did they survive the war? Yes. Okay. So where did you land in Europe when you went? Well, we were Army of Occupation. Uh, however, when we crossed, Army of Occupation, uh, at, the, at the first six months after uh, an armistice is signed, you are still in wartime conditions, and all wartime conditions still exist. So we zigzagged across the ocean. It took us 10 days to get from New York to Bremerhaven, Germany, and they unloaded us in Bremerhaven, and then they, we got our, our assignments there, and we were sent all over Europe, all over Germany and all over France. And I ended up in Reims, France, near what we called the cigarette camps, because the camps in northern France were named uh, Camp Lucky Strike, Camp Chesterfield, Camp Campbell, <laughs> uh, you, you know, and our, our hospital was 198th General Hospital, and it was uh, at the edge of Reims, France, and it turned out to be Napoleon's old barracks, oh, goodness. which was kind of fun. <laughs> so at that first station there in Reims, the soldiers that were coming there for treatment were they most of them coming out of North Africa? No, those boys were the ones that had been in the Battle of the Bulge and the, all the campaigns in, in um, France and Germany, Belgium. Um, the North African campaign ended, I think, in 43 or 44, so 44 maybe, I don't remember. So those boys were already gone and home. These boys were the ones that were wounded, and they were too sick to get back home, uh, had to stay in the hospitals in Europe until they were well enough to travel back to the States uh, under easier conditions. Okay. Now, Jane, before you went overseas and you were, you said there were servicemen who, who actually made it back to the States. Well, a lot of them. You know, no, I mean for for medical treatment, they would go from the battlefield and they would be oh, back yeah. you, to the U.S. You know, in three days. You go to your field hospitals and then you, uh, they air evacuated out of, uh, back to England. They got them back to England from D-Day as quickly as they could, and then from England they were flown immediately stateside and landed in New York, and then immediately flown to various general hospitals in the states. And the the hospitals in the states. Um, had specialties. Now at the uh, at Ashford General, we did a lot of brain surgery. We did a lot of neurosurgery. We did a lot of thoracic surgery. Um, some hospitals did only orthopedics. Some hospitals did only uh, tuberculosis and related diseases. Um, some of them were urology related. And you went to the hospital. The soldier was assigned to the hospital nearest his hometown where his family could get to him during his rehab period. Okay, so <clears throat> you were familiar with working with battlefield injured veterans before oh, yeah. you left the U.S.? They, are, they all were. You know, they were all very well, almost, I would say 98 percent were battlefield related, yes ma'am. And they were, uh, even the, even the uh, malarial patients that's battlefield related because they were in the areas where malaria was pre and the malaria that they had was uh, just horrific. It was unreal. And of course, we didn't have anything but quinidine back then, and uh, it was hard to treat, hard to handle. Okay. Now back at Reims, the hospital you worked at there, were the um, injuries and conditions of the soldiers there a variety or? Yes. 
could be anything. There wasn't any special field in Reams. It was just how they ended up there, you know, just where they had, where they had room for them. Okay. Uh -huh. And did you work like regular shifts? Or? Yes, we did. Our, our night shifts were seven at night to seven in the morning. Doesn't sound like much today because uh, a lot of hospitals work 12 hours and you're off, you know, for three days and then you're off and so forth. But back then, a 12 hour shift was a long shift. And you work what? Seven days a week? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, sometimes, you, sometimes you'd have an afternoon off, you know, you'd be off from noon until the next morning. But you really didn't, you really didn't think about it much. Were, were you assigned specific number of patients or you just helped out in general? Yeah, you were, you were assigned to a ward and the ward, I don't remember how many patients we had on the ward, maybe 20, I don't know, maybe. And I, uh, you were the charge nurse for that ward, period. You were responsible for all the patients on that ward. And you worked with corpsmen, uh, ward men. They're not corpsmen in the Army, they're ward men. And you worked with them, uh, and they could be wax or GIs, either one. And they were your right hand. They helped you care for the patients. And, but it was hands-on as far as uh, a lot of the injuries were concerned. It was hands-on by a nurse. It wasn't just the ward men taking care of the patient. Was there any problem in, in keeping supplies that you needed, drugs and bandages and sheets and things? No, no. Uh, the Army kept us well supplied with that. Uh, we, we didn't have any. I saw the beginning of penicillin while I was in service. Uh, that was new. <laughs> was that at Reams? No, that happened to be in a, uh, while well, I was a um, cadet nurse and it was in the Navy uh, in Bunker Hill, Indiana, which was a school, flight school, prepared the guys to come to Pensacola. And I never did I ever think I'd ever live to see Pensacola. <laughs> but we, they used a wing of our hospital uh, until theirs was built. And we had a patient of theirs, a Navy patient, who required, had a very se had a severe infection. And the Navy doctor, who was a lieutenant commander, said, well, he was going to have penicillin flown from England to treat this patient. And we called it gold. It was gold in color, and it was in a little vial, and you added distilled water, and you shook it up, and it dissolved, and you drew it up, so forth. It was given every four hours. Well, it was so unreal that the doctor, the com lieutenant commander, put a cot in the room with the patient and stayed with the patient for 20, you know, around the clock, 24 hours, watching for reactions and whatnot because it was still an experimental drug at this point. So I saw my first penicillin given while I was in service, yeah. Fascinating. Now, in, in Reams, how did the, did the nurses live in the barracks or apartments? The nurses lived in, the, in Napoleon's barracks and one of the, I don't know what the building at the hospital was, I don't know what it had been, but I know that our barracks were the barracks that, that housed Napoleon's troops. Oh. <laughs> Very little improvement. <laughs> so you're saying it was primitive? <laughs> Very primitive. Okay. So did, you, did the nurses ever get to go shopping or? Uh, only at the PX. You were not allowed okay. to shop anywhere but the PX. Were you restricted in any way? From yes. Okay. You were restricted to where you could go. Um, you could go into Reams. Only certain areas of Reams were you allowed to go. Um, I did get into the cathedral, and um, that's where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. And of course, being a history buff, I thought that was pretty fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, we we had. Every, even Paris, we were restricted in Paris. There were only certain places we could go and certain places we could eat, uh, certain streets we could go down. Yeah, we were still wartime conditions, yeah. Blackout at night, no, no, no lights at night, except in barracks, yeah. Now, how long were you at Reims? Mm, I wasn't there long. I had uh, a couple of months, I guess. During World War II, you had a program called Point System. And if you had 
at the end of the war, if you had 25 points, and that included time overseas and time served and so forth, if you had 25 points or better, you could ask to be discharged. And I had 28 points when I reached there, and I was engaged to my husband to be, and, uh, and, and he was stateside. And I decided along about there, I was ready to go home and be a wife. So I applied to go back to stateside, never dreaming that I would be accepted. I had enough points, but that didn't mean that you would be accepted. And I was told that if I worked my way home, I could go home, and by working your way home, they meant if I would fly on a hospital ship, plane, hospital plane, back to the States, then I could get back to the States sooner. Otherwise, I would be another six months at least. And I chose to go to back to Paris and uh, work my way home on a, I can't remember whether it was a B-19 converted or a B-17. I have a picture of it. I don't remember what it was. Um, we had litters strapped to the bulkhead of the plane. We lost three patients coming home. They died. One we took off in Azores. Two we took off in Bermuda, and then we landed with the rest in uh, Mitchellfield, New York. So yeah, it was work your way home, yeah. So how long were you actually in Europe as a nurse in oh, France? Only several months, several. I don't really, you know, because I applied to come home. Okay, yeah. and France was the only country yes. that you based out of while yes. you were there? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, when you came home, did you uh, get out of the service immediately? or? Were you yes, I was discharged when I got back to the States. Mm -hmm in March that year, I think. I what are some of the memories you have of some of the patients that you treated when you were in Europe? I, well, not uh, particularly in Europe as much as uh, those that came back from like D-Day or, you know. So the ones you saw before you, you know, ever Before went I left because they, they came back so quickly, you know have one in particular was a boy who was 18 years old and he was hit by shrapnel in the six cervical vertebrae in the neck and he was paralyzed from the neck down. And what a sweetheart that boy was. He was unreal. And, uh, oh, I don't know, he, he, he was special. One of the uh, dietitians who used to visit him had her uh, rode a horse and she had her horse quartered there, uh, stabled there. And he told her one day, when he found he could move his hands just a little, he had just a little hand and arm movement, and he said, if you will bring your boots, your riding boots to me, I'll polish them. Tears. <laughs> and he did, little by little, he would work on the, on those riding boots, and uh, she didn't get to ride, but maybe once a week. And every time she rode, she'd bring him her boots and he'd polish them. And he eventually was discharged. And when he was discharged, he had some use of his upper body and arms, but he never, of course, regained the use of his legs. But that was just, it was his um, attitude uh, that made you want to go forward do everything you could do. He was just a special kid. And I, there were a lot of them. Uh, some of them were, some of my uh, malaria patients, when their temps would spike at 105 and 106, and you had to throw icy cold towels on them. And all the time that they were in this state, they were fighting a battle. They were reliving what had put them there. And I found that pretty traumatic. I mean, you know, when you think of it, I was only 20, 21 years old, and this was a whole new world. And uh, things like that live with you forever. Teaching them how to walk again, getting them up on their braces, their leg braces and onto crutches. We had one hall of paraplegics that the guys used to race their wheelchairs down the hall and take bets on point A to point B and who would win. 
but it was their overall general attitude that you loved. It was just fantastic. You couldn't have done it if it hadn't been for them. So you think that helped you keep your own mental Oh, yes, yes. It kept you squared away, you know. And if you made some little mistake, they were the first ones to tell you, which I thought was great. You mentioned one of the highlights of your service was a retreat for General Wainwright that mm -hmm. you assisted with. Can you share about that? General Wainwright, as we all know, was um, a prisoner of war for many years. And when he came home from his uh, captivity, he came to Ashford General Hospital to recoup. <clears throat> and he was uh, such a gentleman. Oh, just such a wonderful person. You would encounter him in the dining hall and whatnot. And uh, he just was a wonderful person. Well, they gave him, awarded him the Congressional Medal of Honor while he was there. And they asked a contingent of nurses to stand retreat. And I was in that group. And uh, it was kind of a highlight of my Army life because of General Rainwright. I knew who he was. I knew a lot about him at that time. For those uh, that may view this that don't know what that means, stand retreat, what exactly does that mean? Well, that means when the flag comes down. At the end of the day. At the end of the day and the, so forth. Um, then if there are any war awards to be given, that's the time of day that, that, that it's done. And um, they have a contingent of soldiers that stand at attention during the retreat. And at this time, they had not only had nurses, they had a contingent of GIs also standing retreat. And a lot of dignitaries, and I don't remember a soul that was there outside of our commanding general. We always had a commanding general at the hospital who was administrator, of course. And uh, I don't really remember any other dignitary. And there were people from Washington I have no idea. All I was centered in on was General Greenrise. <laughs> now, when you came back to America, did you marry immediately? After yes, you well, within six months. Mm -hmm. And your husband then was still in the service? Yes, he was. And what branch was he in? He was medical administrative, which means that he was assigned to a, an Army hospital, Army General Hospital. And he was a post treasurer provost marshal, various jobs, whatever came up, that's what he had to do. Yeah, after your marriage, did you use your nursing? I didn't for a while. Um, I did a lot of volunteer work for, uh, and then I finally went back to work after, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I went back into nursing again. And uh, then I, I held my license, an active license, for 50 years. Goodness. <laughs> when was the last time you worked as a nurse? Oh, goodness. In the late 80s, I guess. Well, I, the volunteer work I did, uh, I did that into the middle 90s, 95, 90, I guess, well, I, I guess up to about 98 I worked as a volunteer. I was a volunteer with the Red Cross Blood Program. And, uh, I was deeply involved in that, and I was also a disaster nurse with Red Cross. I did uh, shelters and disasters and things like that, but I also worked at Providence, uh, OBGYN, labor delivery, a lot of things. I've done a lot of things in nursing. Now, your your two brothers, did they remain in the service? No. To the end of the both war? of them. Both of them got out of the service. One of them's still living. He's 91 years old. As you look back over your life, what do you think your participation as a nurse in World War II, how it impacted your life as a whole? Well, of course, I met my husband in service, and he was from Gloucester, Massachusetts, and a girl from Indiana didn't meet somebody from Massachusetts in the 40s, you know. Um, Well, it greatly broadened my outlook, and it gave me a lot of patience and tolerance. Um, I had an Army chaplain. When we, when we took basic training, we had a, a light colonel chaplain told us that 
the nurses. And I want, well, there's one thing you nurses need to remember, and I've not forgotten it, obviously, is that God does not have a denomination. And when you care for your patients, you remember that, because you don't know what their beliefs are or where they're coming from. Uh, and you are to support whatever their beliefs are you are to give them support in that way. And that was a great lesson to me. Great lesson. Were there lessons your grandfather had taught you that came to bear as you served? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, he was a country doctor in a very, very small town in Indiana. And uh, I had learned from him a great deal about dealing with people uh, and about patience and uh, I learned what to expect in the army. However, he was dead when I went in, but by that time. But I had learned enough from him because he had been in World War One, and my dad was in World War One, and I, I learned enough from these people along the line to have an idea of what I was getting into. And it was uh, discipline was a big deal. Discipline's always a big deal in the army. And I had had that kind of discipline at home with my grandfather, so it was easy for me to accept Army life because I kind of knew what I was getting into, and this was very helpful. Your grandfather, what branch of service was he in? He was a medic. He was a doctor. With the Army or the... In the Army uh -huh, during World War One. And what about your father? My father was in the Army, World War One, and he was in France. My brother retraced my dad's steps when he got to France. He happened to be in the same place, you know, where my dad had been, which was interesting. My uncle was a Marine in World War I, my dad's brother, and he had been in France. So it, you know, it all kind of fell into place. It was like I was supposed to do this. It was like this was what I was meant to do. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I wouldn't, you could almost take anything out of my life but that, and I, I wouldn't want you to touch it. Do you and your husband have children? We had two daughters. We have two daughters. My husband's deceased, but we have two daughters. Did either of them feel an interest in serving in the military? No, never occurred to them. <laughs> or a medical field? No. Okay. Both school teachers. <laughs> okay. Well. We want to thank you for your service and thank you for sharing your time. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? No. I'd like to say to the younger generations, don't be afraid. If you have a job to do, step up and do it. Well, thank you very much, Jane. You're welcome. Wonderful energy. It was marvelous. Of course, I cry a little. Oh, well, this, well, that's why we have these tissues here. Jane, I could listen to you go on all day. Well, <laughs> you, I didn't myself. And uh, I was, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was charting. And um, I heard this voice, and it, it was the officer's ward, of course. And I heard this voice say, Lieutenant, is there a cup of coffee in this hospital somewhere at 3 a.m.? And I didn't even look up. I said, well, they're pretty hard to come by, but maybe I can scratch up one, you know, and kind of laughed about it and looked up, and here's General Eisenhower in his pajamas and robe. And uh, I said, oh, yes, sir, I think I can find your cup. So I, had, I knew the sergeant and Mike Mess, and I called him. And I said, Sergeant, General Eisenhower wants to know if he could have a cup of coffee, of course. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'll get it over there right away. Well, uh, General Eisenhower said, do you drink coffee? And I said, yes, sir. And he said to the telephone, make that two cups, bring two cups. Lieutenant needs a cup, too. So in about five minutes, here comes a little GI with a tray of coffee and urn, you know. And, and uh, so I took it down to General Eisenhower's room, and he had his coffee in his room, and I had my coffee at the desk. <laughs> Isn't that neat? It is. So what a gentleman he was. Oh, just so nice.
not, not, not presuming anything, not demanding anything, really. You know? But it's these little things that made life wonderful. Things that I can still remember. Well, you remember a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when you get old, that's all you have to do is remember. remember. <laughs> But I had a lot of little things happen to me like that. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I imagine your patients loved you. I can just see Well, it. I had a lot of fun with them. Yeah. And I remember, I, do you know what a buzz bomb is? Well, Have I've you ever heard, heard of a buzz I've, bomb? I've heard, yes. Well, you know, the Germans sent them over and they would buzz. And when they quit buzzing, they dropped and exploded over London. This was a terror thing. And it was terrible, I'm sure. I, I wasn't there, but I'm sure it was. But anyway, in uh, some of the rooms we'd have, uh, in Ash for General, we'd have six, maybe six patients, and they were mostly paraplegics. And uh, one boy would, when he, when I'd go in in the morning make rounds, I'd say, well, how'd it go last night, guys? Oh, I, I didn't sleep a wink last night. You know, one of these, anyway, one of the patients, and he happened to be a guy from Selma, Alabama, that I got to know really well and knew his wife and his daughter. And Stu would, this guy would complain about, I didn't sleep a little. And Stu was laying over there in his bed, and he'd turn his head around and he'd say, Lieutenant, first southern accent I ever heard was this guy. Lieutenant, don't let this guy fool you. He laid there and snored like a buzz bomb all night. <laughs> but, you know, these are the things that made it easy to do, yeah. you know. And that guy never complained again. But it was just the camaraderie between the guys. Some of them were hostile to each I had one boy, Italian boy out of New York. <laughs> and... Uh, when he found out I was going overseas, he brought me a miraculous medal. And I'm not a Catholic, but that didn't matter. He said, Lieutenant, I want you to take this medal. It saw me through Italy. And one of the patients said to him, and I took it and I wore it. One of the patients said to him, yeah, ask him how he got shot in the, pardon the expression, the ass. Yes. <laughs> and he said, I was running the other way. How else do you get shot? <laughs> and it was the truth. He was yeah. so frightened, so scared, you know. But that, <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> I, I think things like that are just fantastic. But that's the way it was. And the guys were down to earth. Any braggadocia, he got ostracized immediately because nobody believed him anyway. <laughs> But everybody looked after everybody else. And if a patient went, had a problem in the middle of the night, they let me know, you know. And, the, and on paraplegic wards, most of them sleep all night because there's no pain, they don't feel anything. But if something goes wrong, another patient knows it, then they let you know and you can go in there and you can work and not another soul knows you're in the room. It's little things like that that made nursing. Things you never hear about, right? True. We need more stories like that. Well, that's what I said. I don't have far as me being, you know, and I was in such a short time, and I didn't finish training until 1944. You know, it took me time to get there. there. I was afraid it was going to end before I could get in there. You know? <laughs> and um, I, I, it was just uh, I, something I wanted to do, something I needed to do. And something I'll be thank the Almighty for letting me do it.